today I want to end my sermon series on refocus, breaking down walls. Refocus, breaking down walls. I want you to hone in on John chapter 4. I want you to look at, uh, start at verse 15, where the woman asked him, Sir, give me this water so that I won't get thirsty and have coming here to draw water. And he told her, go call your husband and come back. And she said, I have no husband, she replied. And Jesus said to her, you are right. When you say you have no husband, the fact is that you have five husbands, and the man you have is not your husband. What you say, have just said, is quite simple. Refocus, breaking down walls. On June the 12th, 1987, President Ronald Reagan spoke as he stood in Germany, and he's I'm standing in the Soviet Union, and he's speaking to the people and he's speaking in particularly to General Secretary Gorbachev. And these are his words. He said, if you p seek peace and if you seek prosperity from the Soviet Union and the Eastern Europe, if you seek liberalization, come here to this great gate. Mr. Gorbachev, open this gate. Mr. Gorbachev, tear down these walls. Yes. These words are very profound because I believe that these are some words that we as the church need to learn how to say. We need to speak in our spiritual language of the need to tear down walls. Yes. Amen? Go ahead. <laughs> We need to tear down walls. And so the Gospel of John is one of the most powerful Gospels in the Bible. The New Testament scholars do not consider the Gospel of John to be among what is called the Synoptic Gospels. The Gospel of John was written at a time with boldness that was designed to, ch to challenge all of those who were disciples of Jesus to open up radically with love for all people and, and not to judge people based upon anything. So the context of John is a very powerful gospel for one who wants to understand what Jesus was really about. I definitely encourage you to read all the gospels, Mark, Matthew, Luke. But John is one of the most interesting gospels because John begins his gospel by saying, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God. And then he says that the Word became flesh. We call this in the school of theology, we call this the incarnational theology, a fancy scholarly term which means that the Gospel of John is about helping us to understand where God came from and how Jesus was the personification of God. Because in the Bible, in, in the biblical days, uh, most of most as we live further or farther away from Jesus, Jesus was born in Bethlehem, and really the Gospels came many years after Jesus left the earth. And so the Gospels are all trying to give us a panoramic, notice I said panoramic view of who Jesus was, what his life was about, and what he, his mission was about. So the Gospel of John is what we call in biblical scholarship incarnational theological language. That's a fancy word that means that the Gospel of John is a theological piece. The word theology means God talk. So in the world of John, we see how the writer gives us the center of who is God. And so all of us are theologians. Anytime you articulate your view about God, that makes you a theologian. And all of us in this room are theologians because we're trying to figure out who is God, what, is God, what does God want us to do, and what is God calling us to do. 
So the central message of the Gospel of John was a warning. Notice I said warning. It was a warning to the church that no one should put up any walls where we judge people, even though we do it in the church. The church is known to judge people. But the Gospel of John says, no, no, no. And and so when you go to John chapter 3, verse 16, it says, For God so loved the world that God gave God's only begotten Son. Notice it says that whosoever believes in God should not perish, but shall have what? Eternal life. So we see the Gospel of John saying that all people are welcome. Everyone is welcome into the presence of God. Everyone is welcome into the house of God. There is no time to judge people when it comes to church. There is no time to say we don't want those people in here. There is no time for us to judge anyone because the Gospel of John is saying, whosoever will, let him or her come freely before God. Let him or her come freely before God and stand in the eyes of God. As you, as you know, the church has been known to judge people. So what I did is I went back and I did some research about the, the early formation of the church. You know, at one time there was a guy by the name of Emperor Constantine who was the Roman emperor. And he was the one who led the bishops to establish the church, and it emerged as the Roman Catholic Church. We came out of the Roman Catholic Church as Baptists until when Martin Luther came around in the 1400s. Martin Luther was a Roman Catholic priest in Germany, and he began to critique the Roman Catholic Church. And he said that the Roman Catholic Church was not following the Bible, was not following the Word of God. And so we know that Martin Luther got into trouble. He was He was labeled as a heretic, and he was doomed to be destroyed by the Roman Catholic Church. So those of us who would like to say the church has always been a good place, we have historically documentation that shows that the church has always been a place where we set rules, regulations. By the way, some churches, thank God Petty Church doesn't have this, some churches they actually have signs up that says, We can't do this. Men have to do this. Women can't wear pants and all this stuff. Women can't wear jewelry. There are churches like that. Thank God we don't have that at Petty Church. Thank God. (laughs) I go to these churches. I'm like, oh, my Lord, are we in a church or are we in in a place where we're judging people by what they wear? So we are not a church that is supposed to judge. We're supposed to be in the business of tearing the walls down. So the problem of the Gospel of John is that John had to deal with the synoptic Gospels and this, this problem of exclusism. And John was saying that the church should be a fellowship that is inclusive, not exclusive, The church is supposed to be an inclusive place. Peter Gomes, for those of you who like to read books, Peter Gomes was a professor at Harvard Divinity School, and he wrote this powerful book called The Good Book. It's a classic book that was written in the 1990s. If you like to read, buy the book. It's called The Good Book. Peter Gomes is saying... He says that when we read the Bible, and I'm quoting him, he says when we read the Bible, we are trying our best to interpret the Bible. And then he says when reading the Bible, it is risky and unavoidable just to make wrong interpretations when we read the Bible. In other words, he's saying that the Bible sometimes, uh, when we read it, we, we take things out of context and we use those verses to beat people in the head and say, nah, 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 nah. Hello, I see some hand clapping going on there. The Bible is a good book. It's a good book, but the Bible can be dangerously used to to slap people in the head, beat people up, and because we take things out of context. In the world of biblical scholarship, we call this isogesis, where we read into the text what we think it's saying, but if we exegete the text, research the Bible, we find out that the Bible is sometimes, at most of the time, is not saying what we think it's saying. 
And so that becomes my job. I'm a preacher. The sermon that I'm preaching before you, I have spent roughly 10 hours trying to prepare this 20-minute sermon for you because I had to go back and pull books out, research, to try to understand the context of the Gospel of John. So the Gospel of John is written in a context where it's telling us that the Bible has to be used carefully. We know the Bible has been used to support a whole lot of stuff, folks. Let me just keep it real. The Bible has been used to support racism. Hello, somebody. The Bible has been used to support sexism. Hello, somebody. The Bible has been used to support anti-Semitism. Hello, somebody. The Bible has been used to hurt people, oppress people, discriminate people, because we sometimes take the Bible out of context. The Bible was never written to oppress people because of their racial identity, their social class, their genders. The Bible was written in the words of Ronald Reagan to tear these walls down. Hello, somebody. I'm going to preach this morning. The Bible was written so that we could tear the walls down that separate us from people. Look at you, Petty Church. You've actually torn the walls down of race. Look at all of the people who are here today. We have torn the walls down. We're saying that everybody can worship together regardless of race. So radical hospitality has been what Petty Church has been about. Uh, First Baptist Church is called an international church that is made up over 20 nationalities. Our ministry has broken down the walls of race, and we have recognized that the world is filled with diversity. You know, one day I was walking into Petty Church, And I saw on that door on the side of our building these words, welcome. (laughs) That's on our door, church. Welcome. I'm like, ooh, that's deep. Are we really a welcoming church? Do we really want people to come into this building who may not be like us? Are we really open to the friends of Jesus who have lots of identities? The friends of Jesus, the word welcome is suggesting that we are inviting everyone to the table of God. We're saying welcome to communion. Today is communion Sunday, and communion Sunday is about welcoming everybody. And I'm so glad I am Baptist because in Baptist churches, we do not discriminate with the communion table. We say the communion table is open to everyone who is a believer of Jesus Christ, regardless of their religious affiliation. You can be a Catholic, you can be a Presbyterian, you can be a Methodist, you can come to the table at Petty Church freely and know that you are welcome. Amen? I've learned that many of our churches are not welcoming. I'm not saying this is part of Petty Church. But I'm observing it because when I retired, I remember going to churches not as Reverend Dr. Glenmore Bembry. I just came as a worshiper. And you know what I learned? That some churches have cliques. I remember going to this one church up in Morristown, New Jersey, and I did not know anybody. And, and I was just wiggling myself through the, through the church, and there was a clique of people talking. And I was trying to say, excuse me, can I say something? And I found out that they shut me down because this church had a click mentality. When we have a click mentality as a church, we are not welcoming new people. When we have a click mentality church, we have to remember that when people come to our churches, let me tell you, in my three months that I've been here, every member, every visitor has, who has come to this church has told me that Petty Church is one of the most friendliest churches in the world. That's good news, Petty. We're doing something right. We are welcoming people. So all my friends who've been here says this is one of your strong points at Petty Church because when I walked in the door, Aaron, who was here last Sunday, was talking about Deacon Tune or somebody, one of the deacons said, welcome to Petty Church. And he said they escorted me to a seat. We have to be so careful as to how we welcome new people into the church. But you know what the problem is with new people is that new people bring new ideas. 
Hello, somebody. <laughs> Getting quiet on me. I learned this in Brooklyn that when you get new people in church, you got to be you got to learn how to deal with what I call creative conflict because new people bring new ideas. And those who have been in the church for a long time have gotten used to doing things a certain way. And the new people come and say, let's try it this way. And then we say, well, we've never done it that way before. We have to open ourselves to new ideas. The Bible says that God is doing a new thing. Can we embrace change? The Gospel of John is making a point that our churches were never intended to be like a river. You know, I study rivers. I like to look at rivers. The problem with rivers is that rivers don't move. Did you know that? When you look at a river, it's static. It's just sitting there. And it looks so beautiful. Lakes. But the Gospel of John is saying the church was never intended to be a lake. He is saying that the church was intended to be a river. So when you see a river, a river is what? Moving. It's never static. It's moving. And so the church that John was talking about was moving. It was, it was constantly being open to the Holy Spirit. The woman at the well was an outsider to Jesus. But because Jesus had a river mindset, he did not judge this woman. He did not judge. He knew that she'd had a whole lot of men in her life. He knew, but he didn't judge her. He never said a word about the fact that the man she was living with was, well, by the way, we call it in our day, what we call it today, shacking up, cohabitation. That's what she was doing. But Jesus didn't judge. He didn't say, he didn't say you're shacking up, so you're going to go to hell. He, no, he, no, no, he didn't do that. He just related to her because he saw his role as to tear the walls down. People come to our churches with issues. And if we're in the church judging people, then we're not going to have anybody coming to church. Matthew chapter 7, verses 1 and 2 says, Do not judge, for you too will be judged. In other words, when you start judging people, you open yourself to be judged too. And by the way, we all got skeletons in our closets. Hello, somebody. Even though we appear to be holy, 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 including me, I got some in my, my, my background too. So in case you find some, I'm telling you right now, I have not lived a perfect life. All the Bible says we have all sinned, fallen short of the glory of God. So if we recognize that we're all sinners saved by grace, then we don't have time to judge. So Matthew 7 says, for the same way you judge others, you will be judged and measured your use. It will be measured to you. The woman at the well was hungry for the living waters that Jesus spoke. She says that everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks of the water I give you will become a spring of water That is eternal. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I will not get thirsty and keep coming here to draw. So what were the issues that this woman had? According to John chapter 4, verses 16 to 20. I see uh, many of you looking at your Bibles. Good, you're looking at the Bible because you're trying to figure out, is this a Bible-based sermon? By the way, it is. I'm basing it upon the biblical text, but I'm just going and talking and rambling and trying to help you see the Bible in a relevant day, time for our world today, which is what we call hermeneutics, where we try to interpret the Bible and make it relevant to the world that we're in today. This woman had some issues. Number one, she had a past, and her past was not so good. But Jesus did not judge her because of her past. Number two, this woman felt shame. You know, when you've done some messed up stuff, you feel shame. So the shame of this woman was so deep that this woman would hide all day long because she lived near a well. And she would peep out of her window to see who was outside. And then she would tiptoe to the well because she had shame. That's deep, that sometimes our shame can become so bad 
that we feel that people are going to judge us and we hide in our safe closets. This woman had shame because she knew that she'd had five husbands. By the way, just in case the, the men want to get off on the patriotism and say, oh, these are women. By the way, there's a whole bunch of men in the Bible who, who've done some crazy stuff too. Hello, somebody. Hello, brother. So don't, don't start feeling your, your, your Cheerios. Because, you know, you look at David. David had a whole lot of issues, didn't he? He was the king of Israel. King of Israel. David had done some bad. He committed adultery with Bathsheba. Hello. But God continued to use David because David was a man after God's heart. God uses us in spite of our sins. This woman had shame. Number three, this woman felt oppressed because she was a Samaritan woman. She felt that she was unworthy to be used by God because she was a woman, and then she's Samaritan. Number four, this woman had been abused by men. It's getting real quiet on me out there. You know, abuse... By men is deep for it for women. Hello. That's a whole nother topic right there. How do we deal with women who've been abused by men? This woman had been abused. She had been mistreated because she wanted to be loved by a man. And every man that she met abused her. Woo! You think your stuff is new today? The Bible can address anything that you're going through. Hello, somebody. Abuse is all over the Bible. Women who've been abused by women, by men. This woman had been abused by men. And number four, she felt lonely because she really wanted to be loved. Now, think about it. Now, she had had five husbands. Wow. I can barely deal with one wife. I've been married 39 years, and that's it for me. But this, this woman had, had five husbands. And then she was in a relationship with another man at the moment she met Jesus. And she was embarrassed. Could it be that she was maybe molested? Ooh. That's a whole nother topic right there. Molestation. A lot of folks are, have been molested as children, and they're hiding that stuff. And they need to be released of it. They need to be delivered from it because sexual molestation is deep, y'all. Sexual molestation. She had a past. The Samaritan Jews were in conflict with the Jewish people. And so the, the tension that was going on here in the biblical text is that the Samaritans had developed their own worship center and the Jews had their own worship center. The Samaritans, their worship, Reverend Coleco, was in Mount Gerizim. That's where their worship center was. So there was a whole lot of discrimination going on here in this text with Samaritans. The real Jews did not want the Samaritans to come to their worship center in Jerusalem. So the Samaritans built their own worship center. We know about that here in America. Where people feel unaccepted in a church, they go and form their own church. We know about that here in this country, right? That's why we got so many churches. Because people get mad and fuss and say, well, I'll go start my own church. We have enough churches in Newark, New Jersey, mm -hmm. that if we combined all these churches, oh, my God, we could have a packed audience every Sunday. But because we differ and disagree on things, we have so many churches. They had worship centers. And so I'm ending with some quotes. I'm ending with Martin Luther King Jr. who said, I know that we punch holes in darkness, and I know that if the dawn is coming, the dawn is coming because Thomas Carl is right. No lie will live forever. Dawn is coming before William Cullen Bryant, 
who is right. He said, truth shall, to the earth shall rise again. Dawn is coming because the Bible is right. And Martin Luther King says, what you reap, you shall sow. W.E.B. Du Bois has a beautiful book called Prayers of Dark People. W.E. Du Bois writes, Give us, O God, the gift of human charity. Lend, lead us to know that the bad nature is, is back with, as our passion may be and our men's may always become better. But I, when I was researching for the sermon, I said, you know, I got a lot, a lot of black authors. I need to find some Asian authors. And I found this woman. Her name is Yung Ku Su Kim. Yung Su Kim wrote a beautiful book called Towards Deconstructing, Decentering the New Testament. And I'm quoting Yung Su Kim. She says, the Bible is too important in the hands of the ignorant and, and, is, and is powerful after the reign of Adolf Hitler, we should know better. Did you get that? That when Adolf Hitler rose to power, it was a wake-up call that there are a lot of sick people out there who want to be kings of nations rather than leaders of nations. But then I found another author I think she's African. Her name is Osho Zine Erfling Manuel. She is a PhD poet and she's an ordained priest. And she wrote this beautiful book that I'm reading right now. The book is called Open, Opening to Darkness. And I'm quoting her from her book. She says, In the beginning, the dark waters of the womb was home without ears eyes, a nose, or a tongue without light. There was still a light, smell, sound, taste, and touch. We descended in birth from the great mysteries of darkness, making us rich and full with forever unknown. This is a great book. By the way, books is one of, uh, one of my weaknesses. When I see books, I'm like, okay, let me read this, read that. I just love books. Anybody out there like books? Reading is important to feed the mind. But then I found this brilliant song that I believe brings this sermon together. And I'm ending with his words. There's a great movie coming out about this man, Bob Marley. The church I pastored in New York we were, was made up of mostly West Indian people from Jamaica. And, and I had to learn how to use the Jamaica talk slang. I had to say, yeah, man. And I learned that in the Jamaican culture, Bob Marley was a powerful leader. And Bob Marley wrote this song called, One Love. One love, our heart, let us together and feel, let us come together and feel all right. Hear the children crying, one love. Hear the children crying, one love, saying, give thanks and praises to the Lord, and I will feel all right. Barb Marley is saying that when we learn to unite in one love, we are able to tear the walls down. Amen. Hello, I hear, I hear some amens out there. The more we learn how to love people, the more we learn how to accept people as they are, the more we're able to tear the walls down. So in the words of Mr. Ronald Reagan, our former president, who told Secretary Gorbachev, let us tear these walls down. I come to you today as your interim leader of Petty Church and say, let us tear the walls down. Let us build this church. Let us seek to, to relate to people where they are. Let us strive to bring this church to greatness. Let us strive to, to lift Jesus up because Jesus said, if I be lifted up, if I be lifted up, I'll draw all people unto Petty Memorial Church. So let us lift Jesus up. Let us magnify his name. Let us glorify his name. Because Jesus is a God of love. Amen.